Blackburn Rovers and Manchester United in Match of the Day. First on BBC One, the main evening news and campaign report with Peter Sissons and Helen Rollison. Labour and the Conservatives have crossed swords about who can make the streets a safer place from alcohol-related crime. Labour promised new laws against drunken behaviour. The Home Secretary says most of them are in place already. Police and demonstrators clash outside Downing Street after a march in support of sacked Liverpool dockers. And the Pope defies a threat to his life to keep his promise to Sarajevo. Good evening. Labour have tried to turn the campaign spotlight onto law and order. The party's Home Affairs spokesman, Jack Straw, announced plans for a crackdown on alcohol-related violence and crime, including proposals for tougher licensing laws and curfews on offenders. But the government said the authorities already had the powers to deal with the problem. And the Liberal Democrats claimed that extra police officers were needed more than new laws. Our chief political correspondent, John Sargent, reports from Westminster. Tony Blair this morning took part in a poignant ceremony in a street in Ilford to mark the shooting of a policeman shot dead while answering an emergency call. His bereaved parents wanted the Labour leader to be there and he took the opportunity to underline one of his election themes, the need for the community to be involved in tackling crime. We should thank those serving policemen and women for what they do to protect us against the forces of lawlessness. But we also recognize, in part, that they cannot fight this problem alone. Labour's proposals to tackle drink-related crimes were highlighted at their news conference this morning. Every weekend, people avoid their town and city centers for fear that they will be attacked or intimidated by drunken youths. This situation cannot continue. The public are crying out for effective action. Labour suggests that the problems would be eased with stricter punishments and tougher licensing rules, a ban on public drinking in trouble spots and glasses in pubs to be made of toughened glass to reduce injuries. There's nothing new uh, in these proposals. They wouldn't uh, increase the powers of the courts beyond what they already have. The courts uh, and the police already have the powers they need to deal with drunkenness, largely as a result of the changes that we've recently made. Mr Howard points to the fact that the police can now confiscate alcohol from underage youngsters drinking in public, and the police can target trouble spots. But extra resources are required, according to the Liberal Democrats. Labour's proposals are trifling compared with the Liberal Democrats' insistence that we should put 3,000 extra bobbies on the beat within a year. Uh, Labour are obviously starting very late to think about the problem of drunkenness, which is at the root of much crime. There's no difference now between the parties on the need for a strong stance on law and order, but it remains one of those issues which can really swing votes, and so the parties can't afford to let their rivals claim that on crime they're making the running. John Sargent, BBC News, Westminster. The Conservative Party agent in Lincoln has resigned after admitting raising cash to help a candidate from another party. Robin Meads, who's also the Tories' constituency party chairman in the marginal seat, believed that if a candidate from the Green Party were to stand, it might split the opposition vote enough for the Conservatives to take the seat. After an investigation by the BBC and the Observer newspaper, Mr Meads admitted what he'd done, but said he'd acted alone. Conservative central officers condemned his actions. Our political correspondent John Pienaar reports from Lincoln. Campaigning the traditional way in Lincoln today, with the Tory agent and chairman Robin Meads in charge. But it's emerged that behind the public face of the local party, he'd planned another way to stack the odds in this marginal Tory seat. And tonight, Mr Meads resigned. David Kane of the Greens was offered all or part of his party's election deposit by Mr Meads. The idea was to split the anti-Tory vote, and the offer was captured on tape. The Observer's publishing transcripts tomorrow, and they'll show how Robin Meads explained the reason for his offer to the Greens secretary. Your interest would be to, to be taking um, about one or two percent of uh, votes would go green, wouldn't they? And then presumably that would damage the uh, Labour Party. That's my calculation. 
Then they discussed the method of payment to the returning officer. You would not know who was putting up the money. Right. Right. Um, there would just be an envelope of cash presented to Chris Keywood. I was horrified and amazed because, um, you know, well, I was speechless really because he, um, he seemed to think he could buy me and buy the Green Party. Mr Meads wanted the plan kept secret. There are people in your party who would be quite happy to go along to the Labour Party headquarters and tell them that this is what we're doing and I don't want that to happen really. OK. I mean, I don't even want my own members to know what we're doing. Today, Robin Meads was confronted with the evidence by the BBC. He hadn't offered Tory funds and denied any wrongdoing. I cannot see the seriousness of it myself. It is, it is, all it is is a discussion between two party officials to determine whether there are any ways in which it would be to the advantage of one or the other if certain events happen. But soon afterwards, he resigned. He said in a statement he'd acted alone. Mr Meads broke no law. Conservative Central Office has condemned his actions, but dismissed the affair as a local incident. And now, what looks like an attempt to manipulate the contest behind the backs of the voters here in this marginal constituency has potential to embarrass the party locally and nationally. John Pienaar, BBC News, Lincoln. Labour's front bench spokeswoman on Northern Ireland, Mo Molam, has disclosed that she's had treatment for a brain tumour. She said the tumour was found not to be cancerous. Ms Molam said she regarded her health as a private matter, but media interest had prompted her to give more details of her illness. I was just getting into a kind of web of stories about whether my hair was my own, which it's not, and why I'd put on so much weight. And I just decided that in the end it was easier to go public because my wig could blow off on the front at Red Car and I'd, I'd have some explaining to do. Martin Bell, who's standing as an independent candidate against Neil Hamilton in Tatton, has said he's the victim of a smear campaign. He said his private life, not his politics, was being targeted. They have gone for my private life. I do not know what the focus of this will be, but I suspect it will be the breakup of my marriage in 1980. There was an affair. It was a time of great pain for myself and those close to me, the girls and their mother. I would point out that they are still close to me today. That was 17 years ago. I have come through a great deal since, inclu since, including many wars which have changed my way of being and of doing. And now the rest of today's news. The Pope has begun a two-day... ...handed with a peaceful march in support of a group of sacked Liverpool dockers. For the vast majority, this was an opportunity to take part in what was overwhelmingly a good-natured protest. But trouble began shortly after one section of the march halted outside Downing Street. An orange smoke bomb was lobbed over the heavily fortified gates, and tempers soon began to flare. Paint, bottles, cans and wood were thrown at the police, who soon had to resort to protective helmets and shields. There had been fears of some trouble at the demonstration, especially as it attracted the support of militant environmental groups who were to the forefront of much of the protest. One demonstrator managed to climb onto the gates, while another got inside the Foreign Office, where he threw documents out onto the street to loud applause. Police on horseback eventually dispersed the crowd outside Downing Street, but it did cast a shadow over the day. I'm absolutely appalled that there's been violence on this demonstration because it was we set out come down here from Liverpool on a peaceful demonstration. We've got our families here, we've got women and children here, and as far as we were concerned, we were here to make a protest over our dismissal. Uh, certainly not going to be involved in any violence. But tonight in Trafalgar Square, there were more violent skirmishes, with paving stones and broken bottles thrown at the police. Once again, officers in riot gear had to move in in force. The testers and police were involved in numerous hand-to-hand -hand confrontations before the area was eventually cleared. Gary Duffy, BBC News. And police and... Parties may pretend not to watch the polls, but they do. And tonight particularly, they've been waiting to see if the Tories could maintain the momentum they seem to be picking up earlier in the week. And on the whole, they haven't. Although the first of tonight's polls... Gallup in the Sunday Telegraph has the Tories equaling their best showing in this poll in two months. Labour on 49%, the Tories on 33 and the Liberal Democrats over here on 12%. NOP in the Sunday Times puts Labour on 48, the Tories on 28 and the Liberal Democrats on 17, up six points on NOP's poll on Monday. 
ICM went back to a sample of voters they questioned for the Observer last weekend, the so-called panel study, and these are last week's figures, and when they re-interviewed just over half the people they spoke to last week, there was no change for Labour, the Tories down one, the Liberal Democrats up one, so not much change in that panel study. So the overall trend, and first the pattern of Labour support, the little red dots on the top there showing you Labour support right the way through the campaign so far, since Mr Major called the election, and we add at the end here uh, tonight's two regular polls, uh, Gallup and NOP. Now Labour's range has bounced around, mainly in the low 50s as you can see, but with rather more of the 40s in it this week over on the right, and on average edging down from that high start at 55, but still not sinking below 50 tonight. The Tories beginning below 30, and then scoring a few above 30, and the blue shading shows their range, best in the first half of this week, and on average their trend showed most promise earlier this week too, but it's flattened out again tonight. And the Liberal Democrats, as they often do at election time, benefiting from the spotlight of the campaign to move up, there's their range, the yellow shading there, from the low teens to the mid-teens by the end of this week, on average too, they're clearly making a bit of ground, uh, certainly a, a tilt up at the end here. So very broadly, Lib Dems up a bit, the Labour lead over the Conservatives less than it was at the start now, but still looking very strong. Just a reminder, it was the Conservatives who were in the lead by 8% in the share of the vote of the last election in 1992, and now tonight's two polls suggest a Labour lead of 16% in Gallup and 20% in NOP, and that's a swing of between 12 and 14% from the last general election. Well, what does all this mean? Well, this is the way we estimate people would have voted uh, on the new boundaries in the last general election. Blue for the Tories in most of the seats, and most importantly, in the key marginal seats. Now, here are those marginal seats represented as columns. The higher the column, the bigger the Tory majority last time in these critical seats. Let's just rank them into our battleground to show the staircase the opposition have to climb if they're to push the Tories out of power. The most marginal ones over here on the left, Labour needs to turn at least 57 of these blue seats red up to where Loughborough is on the battleground, number 57 there, and beyond, if Mr Blair is to win a majority. And here's what would happen if party support in tonight's opinion polls were reflected on polling day. Labour, as you can see, way beyond the third column there, way beyond the 57 seats they need, and even winning seats outside the list of marginals. It would be a Labour landslide. But there are still two and a half weeks to go. And NOP tonight suggests there are some interesting battles for public opinion over policy going on. On education, for example, the Liberal Democrats take second place when people are asked which party will best improve standards in schools, with the Tories two points behind. And on the pocketbook issues that counted so powerfully in the last election, Labour and the Tories neck and neck in answer to the question who will keep taxes down with the Liberal Democrats appealing to just 5%. And on the management of the economy, NOP found Labour just one point ahead of the Tories. Now, all the pollsters, including NOP, have asked similar questions about the economy this week, and as well as that 1% lead at the top there in NOP, Labour have a small lead in Gallup on the economy and in ICM, but in the Mori poll in Thursday's Times, the Tories were ahead on this crucial issue. It's a close-fought battle that some believe may tell us more about the likely outcome of this election than that huge Labour lead in the overall figures. Now, as far as the campaign itself is concerned, people say the Tories have been more effective this week than last, although Labour scores the highest on the whole for effective campaigning. More than two-thirds of voters, though, say the campaign has simply failed to fire up their interest at all. Peter, thank you. And the main election news tonight. Labour have concentrated their election campaign on law and order, announcing plans to cut down on drink-related crime. The Conservatives say most of Labour's proposals are law already. And a Conservative agent in Lincoln has resigned after admitting helping to finance a candidate from a rival party to try to split the opposition vote. I'm joined now from Westminster by our chief political correspondent, John Sargent. John, we've got a long campaign. We expected that, but has it developed in a way that anyone expected, really? No, it hasn't really, because what we didn't realise at the beginning of the campaign was the extent to which, with Labour so far ahead in the polls, they would be treated very much as the government in waiting. And it took, I think, some time for the Tories to realise that one of the advantages of that, there aren't many advantages, but one advantage is that you can then take pot shots 
at Labour to try and knock them off their perch. You can behave as if you are the opposition. I think we've seen this last week, how the Tories, when they get their aim right, can then behave in a very effective way as the opposition and that they can prove that it's Labour that have an election to lose. And I think that's what's given the election a lot more interest than we thought it might have. How do they react in the Labour High Command when they get a poll that shows the gap with the Tories narrowing? Well, I think there's a lot of strain behind the scenes because, of course, they realise that as the election goes on, it's likely that their lead will narrow. They've been telling them that themselves that for months and months. And they always realise that when that happens, that's the moment when they've got to show discipline and they've got to be firm. Now, if the polls narrow, one of their hopes will be that then there will be more emphasis back on the Tories and on the Tory record. So they're hoping that perhaps this role reversal we've seen up to now might be reversed if the gap narrowed. Uh, briefly, John, this business in Lincoln with the agent resigning after admitting fundraising to try to put up the Green candidate, any deep repercussions from that? I think it's not likely to be. It's such a strange story, an unusual story, condemned by central office. A very interesting example of in a very marginal seat what might happen if you can persuade an opponent to stand. But I think it's likely to be seen more of a curiosity than anything else. But that's not to say that Labour won't try and make this another example of Tory sleaze. John Sargent, thank you. And that's all from the BBC Newsroom tonight. From Helen and me, good night.